Okay, it's five after. You're uh, welcome to George Mason Observatory, our first summer virtual evening under the stars. We are happy to have you here. Uh, we have been uh, conducting these events now for um, since the pandemic began. Before the pandemic, uh, we had these in person on the George Mason campus, and we've had a great time uh, reaching out to all of you over the past um, several months. We hope you're all safe and healthy and doing okay. Uh, tonight, we're going to have um, a a guest speaker. Uh, his, uh, we'll introduce him in a little bit. We also have two of our students who will be moderating the um, chat. Uh, they're uh, Brandon Toth and Justin Wittrock, uh, an undergraduate and graduate student at George Mason Observatory, uh, George Mason University, respectively. Uh, we have been hosting events here at GMU Observatory since the observatory was founded uh, about a decade ago. And uh, we've had to transition due to the pandemic to these online forums. And we've had actually um, great response from the community over uh, the first two events we held during the spring. And so we're going to be continuing these over the summer. One of the great things about these events is that the night sky changes. So if you come back to our events in four weeks or four months or four years, it'll have a different view of the night sky than you um, will have tonight. Uh, tonight we're excited to uh, start with the moon afterwards. Uh, so we'll have our speaker, then we'll open up our dome, we'll give you a virtual tour of our observatory, and then we'll actually let you look at some live images. Um, when we do uh, get past this pandemic, we'd like to welcome all of you that are in the local area to come join us in person. We'll probably continue these events online. Uh, and just to conclude my introductions, I'd like to tell you about our newsletter, The Moon, which you see on the screen right now that just came out today, our first edition. We used to have uh, our former director, who I'd like to acknowledge has been a, a great um, uh, contributor to the observatory. Without his work, we wouldn't have had a telescope to share with you tonight. Uh, we have now transitioned that to an online format and that uh, newsletter uh, got sent out. If you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, you can go to science.gmu.edu slash research slash facility slash observatory, or to make it a little bit easier, if you find us on Twitter at GMU Observatory or email us at gmuobservatory at gmail.com, we can send you more information about that, about our future events. Uh, we also have a philanthropic program called Patrons of the Observatory. If you're interested in supporting the observatory and its future work and the students that we have that give these tour guides that do research with our campus telescope. We encourage you to consider making a donation uh, to uh, the foundation that supports the George Mason Observatory. Uh, we also have some really exciting events coming up that are announced in the newsletter in particular in partnership with the Smithsonian Associates Program on July 14th, just 12 nights from now on a Tuesday night, we will be having a lecture on life in the universe uh, hosted by the Smithsonian Associates Program. Uh, that is not free, um, the, so you have to buy tickets for that in advance. Uh, and our, our speaker that night will be Dr. Michael Summers. We will have the JPL Spirit and Curiosity Rover uh, program manager uh, from NASA JPL. He'll be speaking. With the Smithsonian program in September and that topic will be uh, on the fall colors of stars uh, also uh, known as uh, stellar evolution and types of stars. So we'll be talking about that with the Smithsonian program uh, going this summer. All right, so at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest speaker. He's a professor of astronomy at UC Riverside. And we're gonna, for the first time today, I'm gonna pass off the baton to him so he can share his screen and introduce himself. I'm pleased to introduce the esteemed Dr. Stephen Kane. So I'll go ahead and mute myself. And then I'll...
Okay. I hope everyone can hear me. Let me just try sharing my screen. So Peter, it says um, that I'm not able to share screen. Yeah, that's what I expected. So give it a try now. All right, that seems to be working better. Great. Okay, can you see? Is yours? So hopefully you can see uh, my title slide there. All right, great. I'm getting a thumbs up from Peter. That's good. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Peter, for that introduction. And it's really great to be talking to you all wherever you are in the world. I, I imagine there's people could have called in from all over. I saw in the chat that someone had uh, called in from Taiwan. Um, but uh, I wanted to uh, just uh, tell you all a little bit uh, today about some of the things that uh, I've been doing uh, with planetary science and with exoplanets. And um, let me just adjust something here real quick. Okay. So, uh, I've been working on uh, exoplanets for about 20 years, and uh, I work on planetary science now as well, meaning uh, I study objects in the solar system mostly as analogs for, uh, for planets outside of our solar system. And uh, what you can see in the background of this, uh, of this slide is a picture of our nearest neighbor, our nearest planet, which is, of course, Venus. And uh, this is a picture that was taken by the Japanese spacecraft, uh, Akatsuki. And it's a, it's a beautiful planet, uh, but very, very different from the Earth. And that's what I'm going to be talking mostly uh, about this evening. And to start, I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a, ba a background of what we've found for exoplanets and how this all ties together. So. Just to start out, uh, as I mentioned, I've been working on exoplanets for uh, actually about 25 years now, but it was almost 20 years ago when I made my, uh, made my first uh, discovery of an exoplanet. Uh, it was a giant planet in just a few days orbit, uh, orbiting a star very similar to our sun. Uh, and it was discovered with a technique which we call the transit method. And that's when the planet crosses the disk of the star and it blocks out some of the light from the star. And so we see the change in brightness of the, of the star. I'm not going to talk a lot uh, about the different ways in which we find planets. I'm mostly just going to talk about the difference of them in terms of their size and things like that. But I wanted to mention this case because uh, in order to find many more uh, planets, what we found was that trying to find planets by measuring the brightness of stars was very difficult to do from the ground for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons was that the Earth's atmosphere makes trying to get these precise measurements very, very difficult. And so what we uh, uh, did was we launched a telescope into space to solve this problem. This was a telescope which was launched in 2009 uh, this was a NASA mission uh, called the Kepler mission. And this was a mission that was devoted to the task of finding planets around other stars, especially Earth-sized planets. And it wasn't deployed into a low Earth orbit like the Hubble Space Telescope. It was deployed to a location where it follows the Earth around the sun. And by doing that, it was able to continuously stare at a single patch of sky and it ended up finding thousands of planets that we didn't previously know about. And that's really changed our ideas about how many planets might be out there, but what their distribution of sizes might be as well. Uh, and so it was a very successful mission after having found so many planets. And what I'm showing you here are a couple of graphs which give you an idea about how this, how the uh, sizes of planets plays a role in how frequently they occur. So on the left, there is a plot which shows the planet mass 
And on the horizontal axis, you can see it says orbital period. That's how long it takes for the planet to go around its star. For example, for the Earth, that's 365 days. Uh, but on the right-hand plot, you can see it's this very similar thing, except now we're showing planet radius, the size of the, of the planet. And uh, we've got three lines there for our standard units of measurement, if you like, Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter. And that's because we can directly compare to sizes of those planets in our solar system. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But there's a couple of really exciting things here because what's shown in the plot on the right are the discoveries from Kepler. The, the blue and the purple ones, those were mostly discoveries that have occurred from other techniques or discoveries that occurred before Kepler. But the discoveries of Kepler are shown in yellow. And you can see that it's just overwhelmed everything else. But the particular thing to note is that those discoveries are much smaller in size than the ones that we had found before. And the key lesson here was that small planets are much more common than large planets. We can see that very clearly from this diagram that we have far fewer of the large planets, but many more of the small planets. And this is very exciting because it means that there could be many planets which are the same size as the Earth. Certainly that's true, but it also could mean that there are planets which are like the Earth in other ways other than just their size. In particular, it could mean that there are many planets out there that might be habitable like the Earth. And this is something which is really draws the focus of uh, a lot of the work that we do now, which is trying to find these planets which are far enough away from their star where they could be in what we call the habitable zone of a star. And this is a region around the star where you could have water in a liquid state on the surface. And this is important because we do consider that the presence of surface liquid water has played a key role in the evolution of life on Earth for a number of reasons. But you can see in this diagram here, it's this green shaded region, which is the how the habitable zone is defined. So down the bottom, you can see our solar system and that the Hubble zone starts just beyond Venus and then it goes through Earth and then extends almost all the way out to Mars. If you go all the way out to Mars, then that's where the surface liquid water would start to freeze to the surface and you wouldn't be able to get biochemistry necessarily happening very easily. So the Hubble zone is a useful tool to look for these kinds of planets. And what's shown uh, above the solar system there is an example of one of these that we found. It's called the Kepler-186 system, which means it's the 186th system that was discovered by Kepler. Uh, and in that system, we found a planet that was about 10% larger than the Earth, uh, and it's in the Hubble zone of its star. And we had a big press release uh, about that at the time and made a big deal about it because it is very exciting. But we always need to uh, be conscious of the fact that we don't know for certain that the, that planet is habitable. That's going to require additional work. And what we really need to do is we need to measure the atmospheres of these planets. Measuring the atmospheres of these planets is key because it can tell us about what the atmosphere is made of, and in particular, if there's any biological activity that may be changing the atmosphere in the same way that Earth's atmosphere has been changed through time, through biological activity. So the way in which we do this is, uh, at the moment, is uh, if there is a planet which is orbiting another star, uh, then if that planet transits its star, it passes between us and the star, then what will happen is the light from the star will pass through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to us. So in this example, you can see the planet in the foreground, the star in the background, and the light from that star will go through the atmosphere and we will have a measurement of that light from the star but also what chemicals may have absorbed the light as the light passed through the atmosphere. And that is the key to telling us what the atmosphere might be made of. So this is the stage that we're currently at or rapidly heading towards in the future. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. 
But here's something that we need to think about, which is that when we talk about the search for exoplanets, it's primarily an astronomical effort, which is that uh, we are studying the stars very, very carefully and inferring that there is an object present. And as I mentioned, we can get so far as detecting that there is an atmosphere for that planet and what that atmosphere could be made of. And this is very exciting. However, astronomers are not experts for the most part at interpreting uh, planetary atmospheres. And they're certainly not experts in the kinds of things that can influence the atmosphere, be they biological or, uh, or geological. And so what this is really forcing is a merging of sciences, which means that uh, astronomers, once we have a measurement of an atmosphere, we need the help of our colleagues from biology, from climate science, from geophysics, from planetary science, uh, and particularly that last one, because uh, the folks in planetary science have been studying exactly these kinds of objects in our solar system for many, many years. And all of our models of planetary atmospheres originate for the most part from planetary science. And this is this field that we refer to as astrobiology. That seems to imply that it's just astronomy and biology, but actually the truth is it combines all of these different sciences together. It's very exciting that the atmosphere of a planet is what's bringing all of these different communities together. But there are still many, many challenges that we have to face. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to devote most of the rest of my talk telling you about two cases that we need to consider very carefully. And I refer to these as the planet we wish that we had and the planet we could not imagine. So first of all, I'm going to tell you about the planet we wish that we had. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what our solar system looks like. And in particular, you're familiar with the fact that we can broadly divide our solar system into two kinds of planets, the giant planets and the smaller terrestrial rocky planets like the Earth. But one of these, uh, the side effects of this is that we end up with this enormous gap between those two. It's a natural dichotomy that we see within our own solar system. And in fact, if you put the largest terrestrial planet, which is the Earth, next to the smallest gas giant, which is Neptune, then you can see the extent to which they're different. Neptune is four times the size of the Earth and it is vastly different in terms of its structure and many other features. And so there is this incredible gap between these two kinds of planets. And a question that has plagued people who study the solar system for many years is, is, is this gap real? Do we expect to find this in other planetary systems or do we expect to find planets of all the sizes in between? And the answer is very much the latter. Because when we look at planets around other stars, and what's shown here are some examples of planets that have been discovered, as you can see from the names, these are mostly planets that have been discovered from the Kepler mission, including the aforementioned Kepler 186f, which is, as I said, 10% larger than the Earth. But look at the sizes of them, because we start with Earth, which is the smallest, out of this group here. And then as we go to the left, they get gradually bigger and bigger and bigger until we get to Kepler 22b. And Kepler 22b is around about twice the size of the Earth. In fact, if we look at the even bigger picture, here is a slide which shows a range or the, the entire range of different sizes of planets that were found with Kepler. And this was quite early in the mission as well, that we put this information together. But what you can see here is that if we start at the top right, which is the largest, that's almost 20 si times the size of the Earth. And if we move down in size, eventually we get to Jupiter, shown in a red box, which is about 11 times the size of the Earth. Then as we move down in size again, you'll see that towards the middle, slightly to the left, also in a red box is Neptune, which as I mentioned, is about four times the size of the Earth. Now, if 
the distribution of planets outside of our solar system was like the distribution inside, then we should expect a gap and we should go straight to Earth. But you can see that we don't. The sizes keep gradually moving down until we get to Earth shown in the bottom left. And so there is this uh, a huge gap in our solar system which doesn't seem to be very prevalent elsewhere. And it means that there's a large amount of planets out there for which we have no analogs within our own solar system. We don't have any examples of them. And this is a real stumbling block for us to try and understand them and to interpret our observations that we make of them. And I'll show you an example of that. This is an example uh, called GJ1214. And GJ1214b, uh, uh, this planet is about 40% uh, larger than the Earth. Uh, it was discovered around about the time, actually, that Kepler launched. Uh, and this is a, a, an incredible planet because it does transit its star, and it means that we can do a lot of follow-up observations of it, including trying to measure its atmosphere. When a planet is like this, we don't know quite if it's terrestrial or if it's a giant planet because it falls into this middle ground. And so when we've tried to understand what the, uh, what the planet could be made of, then our, our models have a great deal of what we call degeneracy, which means there are many models which fit the same data set. So we don't know for certain what's going on. What I'm showing here is a flow chart from a great scientific paper that was written by Leslie Rogers and Sarah Seeger back in uh, 2010. And uh, what they did was they started with different scenarios out of which this planet could have formed. They considered rocky scenarios, ice scenarios, and gas scenarios. And what that led them down to were three different cases of what the planet could be like. It could be a water planet, or it could be a, what we call a super Earth, something which is terrestrial, but slightly larger than the Earth, which may have outgassed a lot of the, of the material from the inside. Or on the other hand, it could be what we call a mini Neptune, which means it's essentially a gas giant, but just slightly smaller than Neptune. And we don't really know the answer to that. And this is a real problem for us going forward. But it didn't have to be that way because there, uh, th there are scenarios in which the solar system could have had a planet which was twice the size of the Earth. And in fact, when we first started to discover the asteroids, which was when the uh, telescope started to be used on, on the night sky after its invention, and we started to discover asteroids such as Ceres, the largest one, and then we found others, and then we found many more. And we eventually realized that there was a distribution of objects lying between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, which we now call the asteroid belt. And the original theories that were put forward was that there was originally a planet there. And it was even given a name. If you look at the scientific literature, it was given the name Phaeton. And the idea was that Phaeton was a, a large planet that was once there, but somehow, it was destroyed, uh, either through impacts or interactions with the other planets, and the asteroid belt is all that remains. We now know this not to be true, but we know that there was never really a planet that was formed there in the first place. But I ask you all to imagine, just for a moment, that what it would be like if we had a planet called Phaeton that was two times the size of the Earth, and how many uh, European and NASA missions, we would have orbiting Phaeton right now. And we would all remember that moment when one of these spacecraft dropped a probe into the atmosphere of a Phaeton, and we were all wondering what it would find. Would it strike a, a rocky surface, or would it continue to uh, sink into an increasingly dense liquid type material? And that we would be studying Phaeton in great detail. There would be groups of people that spend their whole career studying Phaeton. This is, of course, all imaginary because we don't have a planet called Phaeton and we don't have anything like Phaeton. And the fact of the matter that we need to contend with is that we never will. And if you ask 
uh, many of the folks in the exoplanet community what kind of planet they wish the solar system had that it doesn't presently have. Most of them would say, I wish we had a super Earth, or I wish we had a mini Neptune. I wish we had a planet that was twice the size of the Earth because we will never have data of an atmosphere like that, that we can study in detail, but we really wish that we did. And so that's a, a huge gap that we have. That is a struggle going forward. Uh, where we wish that we had that in-situ data from our solar system. But now the flip side of that I'm going to tell you about is the planet we could not imagine. And I am, of course, talking about Venus. This is the picture I showed you at the beginning, the beautiful picture of Venus uh, from the Akatsuki spacecraft, which is orbiting Venus right now. It's taking these beautiful pictures, which are in the ultraviolet, and so we get to see a lot of the colors of the deeper cloud structure. Uh, but we know now that if we were to take away the clouds of Venus, that it actually looks like this, and that it has a completely hostile surface. Now, this is not something that we knew for a fact until relatively recently. Uh, as many of you know, there was a lot of science fiction being written about possible life and civilizations on Mars about 100 years ago or more. But a lot of those were very quickly put to rest because we can see the surface of Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. The same was not true of Venus. And in fact, science fiction of Venus continued into the late 60s. Uh, what I'm showing here are a couple of movie posters uh, for some of the last movies that were made that depicted astronauts going to the surface of Venus. The, the one on the left is a 1959 movie with the Three Stooges. Uh, they went to the surface of Venus and they spoke to uh, a giant fire-breathing tarantula and a, an invisible unicorn. It was kind of what you'd expect of a Three Stooges film. Uh, but the one on the right is uh, the very last one that was made in 1965. And it was the last film that uh, was made that, that depicted the surface as kind of a, a, a lush uh, jungle environment. And in fact, they went there and they found that there were dinosaurs still living there. Uh, but what happened in 1965? Well, in 1965, the Russians and the, and the American space programs, they had a concerted effort to really try and solve this mystery about what's actually going on at the surface. And in particular, the Venera program from the Russians sent a couple of landers to the surface. And the ones that made it to the surface uh, found an extraordinary environment. The surface of Venus has a temperature of around about 850 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, not only that, it has an, uh, an atmospheric pressure of, of, of about 90 times the atmospheric pressure that we experience at the surface of the Earth. Uh, it also has sulfuric acid in the atmosphere it's what we could describe as a completely hostile uh, environment. Uh, and we didn't know uh, any of that until we actually went there and took these measurements because the, the cloud and the atmosphere was so impenetrable. But also we didn't have good models for, for how to try and model a, a very complex atmosphere like this. And this has uh, become a real problem in exoplanets as well. Uh, because this is the nearest planet. Uh, we have sent probes there down to the surface uh, and uh, there is a concerted effort within the modeling community to try and recreate various uh, atmospheres uh, by starting usually with an earth-based uh, climate model and then modifying it so that we can model the atmosphere of, of uh, Mars, for example. And these are gradually being applied to exoplanets as well. However, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Francois Forget, uh, is one of the uh, leading experts in the modeling of planetary climates and applying it to exoplanets. And, the, and let me show you what he said about modeling the atmosphere of Venus. He said, if Venus did not exist in our solar system, we would not dare to imagine it. And what he meant by that was that our current models uh, are unable to predict the Venetian atmosphere. 
we would imagine perhaps that if we were to uh, um, move Earth slightly closer to the to the sun, then it would get hotter and maybe we'd have more carbon dioxide. Uh, but none of our models can completely model that transition from something like Earth to something like uh, Venus. And so what he was really saying was, if you imagine, I previously asked you to imagine a, a scenario in which we had a two Earth radius planet between Mars and Jupiter. Now what I'm asking you to do is to subtract a planet. If you imagine that, uh, that our solar system consisted of Mercury, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and that we did not have Venus, you need to erase it from your memory, then you can very quickly start to imagine how cavalier we would be about attributing the atmosphere of a planet to the size. Uh, we would be uh, very quick to assume that planets the size of the Earth are habitable uh, in the same way that Earth is habitable, but Earth and Venus are approximately the same size. Uh, and in particular, when we tried to model or create models of what would happen if you had an Earth-like planet and moved it closer to the sun, or changed it in, in some significant way that resembles Venus, we would have been completely wrong when trying to predict what was going on at the surface. And this is a very scary lesson uh, for those of us who uh, work on exoplanets and are interested in trying to predict what the surfaces, uh, surface conditions of those exoplanets might be like. Uh, and so this is something that we have to contend with. Uh, just to show you uh, another example of how complicated it can be for Venus, this is a, a, a recent image of, uh, of Venus. Uh, this is, once again, these data are from the Akatsuki spacecraft. And what's extraordinary about uh, these images is that you can see in that top left uh, picture of Venus is that it almost looks like there's a wave in the atmosphere. And that's not too far from the truth. It is a standing wave, but the question is what's causing it? Well, you know, sometimes when I tell people that the, that the surface pressure, the atmospheric pressure uh, at, at the surface of Venus is about 90 or 92, 93 um, Earth atmospheres, that can be a little hard to imagine. And so what it's equivalent to is about a kilometer depth in the ocean, which is way below the safe scuba diving depth. Uh, that's an immense pressure. And so if you can imagine that the atmosphere at the surface of Venus is, uh, is moving at the pressure of a kilometer depth in the ocean, then you can quickly understand that it has a complex relationship with the topography of the planet meaning where there's continents. And it turns out there is an equatorial continent for Venus, it's called Aphrodite Terra. And so part of what you're seeing there is the interaction of the atmosphere with the equatorial continent of Aphrodite Terra and the, uh, the, the resulting impression that leaves in the atmosphere. There's many things like that about Venus that we're only just now discovering. Uh, and there's many more questions that are left to be answered. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of some of the main questions about Venus that we still don't know uh, the answers to. And keep in mind that this is the closest planet that we're talking about, the same size as the Earth. Uh, and yet we're trying to characterize planets which are several light years away. So uh, first question, what is the interior structure and composition of Venus? And how much does it differ from the Earth? When we look at, the, uh, look at Venus, we assume it's uh, similar to the Earth, and perhaps it is, but we know very little about it. We don't know what the interior is like. We don't know what the size of its core is. Uh, there's very little information that we have at all. Uh, and so that's something that we need to understand in order to get more data on what the structure of terrestrial planets is like. And that's very important for the second question here, because the structure, of the, uh, the internal structure of the planet relates very strongly to the geological history of the planet. What we want to know about Venus is, has it had a history of plate tectonics? 
In other words, the, some plate's been subducted in under the surface and been outgassed again, because that has been critical for the recycling of carbon in the atmosphere for the Earth and allowed the Earth to remain at a fairly temperate climate for almost its entire history. And what we really want to know is, was Venus always in its present state or did that happen relatively recently? As I said, the Earth has plates that move around and they move under each other. Venus doesn't have that. It has essentially one giant plate, which we call a stagnant lid. And what we would uh, love to know is how recently that happened and is there any kind of plate movement going on at the moment. The atmosphere is incredibly uh, difficult for us to understand because as I mentioned, it's so thick and it's difficult to make it all the way down to the surface because of the extreme conditions. Uh, and in particular, the middle and the deep atmosphere closest to the surface. Uh, we want to know how they interact with each other and how they interact with the, with the surface. We also want to know uh, if it had water and if it did, where did the water go? And how, how was the, that water lost? Because there are many ideas that Venus, in fact, did have a formation that was very similar to the Earth's, which means that Venus once had oceans. And in fact, that leads to that last question about was Venus ever habitable? As I mentioned, we've, we've seen many science fiction uh, novels and movies about uh, Venus currently being habitable. Clearly, it, it presently isn't, but it could have had a period in the not too distant past uh, when it, what, it did have surface liquid water. And so we want to know how long it was habitable for and what caused that to change. And so this is an artist's picture of what Venus could have looked like. And this is significant because something uh, I often say to my exoplanet and planetary science colleagues is that if you ignore the axis of time, then you are ignoring most of the information that the solar system has to teach us. Uh, because the, uh, the planets that we see in our solar system, all of them have gone through dramatic changes with time. And Venus clearly has gone through a lot of changes. But if we were an alien civilization that was looking at our solar system, when the solar system was only 3 billion years old compared to its current 4.5 billion years, you, it's, there's a very good chance that that civilization would have concluded that there were two planets with oceans and probably habitable. And so this is something that's quite significant for our understanding of looking for signs of habitability when we look at planets around other stars. Another thing that we really want to understand is not just how did uh, Earth and Venus diverge, but was it a uh, something which produced a true dichotomy? And what I mean by that is if you assume that Earth and Venus had very similar starting conditions, they both had surface liquid water for, for many, many years, but at some point something changed. And if that thing that changed was, for example, Venus losing its water and no longer being able to recycle its carbon through subduction of the surface into the interior, then that pushed it into a runaway greenhouse. And so that uh, leads to the possibility that either you are able to continue uh, with subduction and recycling your carbon, or you cannot. Earth obviously has been able to do that, and Venus probably didn't. Now, it could be a true dichotomy, but then again, we only have two pl uh, planets in this particular sample. And so we do need to consider the possibility that there's a whole range of outcomes to this planetary evolution. And that's what we hope to learn about uh, when we look, for, uh, look at similar kind of planets around other stars. Uh, and so what I want to do uh, in my uh, remaining minutes is just to tell you what our plan is for that and to what the path forward may hold. So first of all, I'll tell you about the uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. That's a mission that both Peter and I are very involved with, and uh, it's made a lot of great discoveries, including one by Peter just recently. And, uh, and this mission 
is looking for planets using the transit method the same way as which Kepler did, except it's doing this for the whole sky. And what this animation is showing, you might be able to hear a slight voiceover uh, uh, trying to describe this, but what it's doing is that TESS, unlike Kepler, is orbiting the Earth. And that means it's, it's, it's uh, attached to the Earth, going around the sun, and as the Earth goes around the sun, TESS points to a different patch of the sky and looks at those stars to determine if they could have any planets. And by doing that, it's finding planets which are orbiting very bright stars. And that's very useful because as I mentioned, the way we learn about atmospheres is from the light from the star passing through the atmosphere on its way to us. That means the brighter the star, the better the measurement we're able to make. But how are we going to do those measurements for the planets which are discovered with TESS? And that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes in. The James Webb Space Telescope, as you know, uh, has experienced some delays, uh, but hopefully it will be uh, launched in the not too distant future. Uh, the James Webb will not be in an Earth orbit. It will be deployed to uh, a location far from the Earth where like Kepler, it will be able to stare continuously at certain patches of the sky. And in particular, it will be able to observe a planet that was discovered, say by TESS, as the planet passes in front of the star and look for exactly the kinds of atmospheric signatures that we were just talking about. And so James Webb um, is going to be crucial for, uh, for this pathway. Uh, but James Webb is only the beginning. By the way, you can see in this animation how the James Webb telescope is going to deploy uh, once it, it reaches its location. Uh, this is the kind of animation that really scares me <laughs> and many of my colleagues because I'm not an engineer, but I just hope that everything goes according to plan. It's, it's pretty much a transformer in the way that it has to unfold. And we hope that everything uh, goes well. So once we have the James Webb, uh, we'll be able to follow up on a lot of these test planets. And that'll be really, really exciting. But as I said, James Webb is another step in uh, the whole process, but it's not the whole story because uh, NASA has, and uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, have numerous plans going forward for other missions that could help us to identify uh, to examine the atmosphere of uh, planets around other stars. You can see on this diagram that there's two tracks. The top one is the one from NASA and the one beneath that, starting with Corot, is the European, uh, uh, European mission. And so we have uh, finished the Kepler mission. TESS is currently operating. JWST will be coming soon. We have uh, a new mission after that. Uh, called WFIRST, it recent, recently changed its name to uh, Roman, named after uh, Nancy Grace Roman, a uh, pioneering uh, person at NASA uh, headquarters. And uh, the, the significance of the WFIRST or, or the Roman telescope is that uh, that is going to test some technology in being able to directly image in uh, exoplanets. And that will lead into uh, future missions you can see there it says New Worlds Telescope, but there are other mission names under that called the Habitable Exoplanet Imager and Lavoie, and those will be able to do much more of the same kind of work. And the Habitable Exoplanet Imager is exactly as described. And so that is, the, that, that is our ultimate goal of trying to get to that place where we can start to look at the atmospheres of these exoplanets more carefully. So that's from the exoplanet side. Uh, but going back to the Venus side, <laughs> as I said, there are, there are numerous questions that we're still trying to answer. And in particular, are more of these rocky planets that we're finding around other stars, are they more like Venus or are they more like uh, the Earth? And as I said, do Venus and Earth represent a true dichotomy? Another uh, thing that uh, uh, some say is that Venus is in many sense a preview into Earth's future because uh, there are, uh, there's all kinds of ideas about what exactly went wrong on Venus, whether it was 
the uh, breakdown of its carbon cycle or whether it was the increasing luminosity of the sun, various things which could have pushed it into this runaway greenhouse state. But in any case, it could be that we learn a lot of lessons about the future of Earth by studying uh, Venus. But here's the key thing that we always need to keep in mind, which is that we are never going to have in situ data for an exoplanet. Sometimes people ask me, do I really mean ever? And I, I think I kind of do, <laughs> or, or at least not for the next couple of hundred years. You know, it's going to require dramatically new physics in order to be able to get to planets around other stars. But what we can uh, certainly say for now is that we're not going to be dropping uh, a probe into the atmosphere of an exoplanet. We're not going to have a lander. We're not even going to have an orbiter for any of these exoplanets. We, we will not have in-situ data of any kind. And what does that mean? It means that for the foreseeable future, all of our interpretation of exoplanet data will be based on the models that are produced from the in-situ data that we have from here in the solar system. And in particular for atmospheres, it means that Venus, Earth, Mars, Titan, those objects within our solar system that have substantial atmospheres are critical for us to have any hope of understanding the atmospheres for exoplanets. And so if we still struggle to understand the atmosphere of the nearest planet, then it doesn't lend a lot of hope for correctly interpreting exoplanet atmospheres until we're able to solve these riddles about uh, uh, the Earth's twin. Uh, but good news is, is that we are starting to do things about this. NASA has a renewed interest in Venus for a number of reasons. Uh, and NASA has not been to, um, to Venus since the, uh, since the 90s with the Magellan mission, but there are plans to go back. And I'm happy to be part of a few of the missions that are pursuing this. We're considering a, uh, a flagship mission, which will have a whole lot of components. It'll have an orbiter, a glider, a probe, a lander. One of the uh, things that comes up all the time is, well, how long will the lander be able to survive? Because the Venera ones only lasted about an hour. And what I've discovered is that technology has come substantially further uh, since that used by the Venera uh, uh, landers during the 60s, 70s and 80s. And that the landers on Venus that have been designed can now last for months. And in, and in some cases, there's even designs for a rover on Venus, if you can imagine that. And so um, we should not let that be a barrier to us pursuing this. So there's a lot of work that's going on there. Uh, another mission I wanted to uh, mention is the Da Vinci mission. This is one that was recently selected uh, as a Discovery class mission. Uh, the PI is uh, Jim Garvin uh, at NASA Goddard, and uh, I'm working with the folks uh, there to, to make sure that that mission happens. And once again, that is, has a primary science component to understand the evolution of habitability and Venus-like exoplanets. And so there's a lot of reasons why we could go uh, back to Venus. Uh, we want to understand uh, Venus itself. We want to understand our solar system. We want to understand the evolution of habitability and how that could apply to Earth. But certainly we want to understand uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets and uh, uh, Venus uh, is a key towards that. So as I said, there's a lot of reasons. You could pick your own reason. Here I give <laughs> uh, one reason that we could uh, go to Venus. Uh, but uh, I, uh, as you can tell, I'm a heavy uh, advocator for, for going back to our, our twin, our sibling planet, and finally unlocking uh, all of these secrets uh, that she holds. So I think I'll stop there and take any questions. It's hard in a Zoom meeting to not be able to hear uh, all the participants clapping. So uh, people <laughs> are welcome to turn on their videos and, and clap on screen and wave and, and thank uh, Dr. Stephen Kane for an excellent talk or place in the chat. We've got some claps in the chat as well. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Kane. That was a, an amazing talk, and I'm actually really um, 
excited to see your passion for the future reinvigoration of the study of the planet Venus. I, uh, yeah, you convinced me, and I'm really excited to see that you're involved in a lot of those future uh, mission concepts. Yeah, thank you. Take my money, taxpayer dollars. <laughs> okay, so we're going to open it up to Q&A now, and uh, we have some questions for the speaker, and I'll go ahead and ask the first one. And then um, please uh, post any questions you have in the chat. Uh, our first question comes from David Willens. How do you measure the atmosphere of an exoplanet when you see the spectrum from a star as it as its light transmits the atmosphere of an exoplanet and you assume the spectrum of the star is constant and do you see the change in the spectrum how does that work yeah this is so um like a lot of parts of uh exoplanetary science it requires a very deep understanding of the star uh and so we normally obtain a lot of spectrum uh, when the planet is not transiting. <laughs> so we try to understand the spectrum of the star very, very carefully. And usually it's not sufficient to be able to, uh, to just measure the, uh, the effect of the planet during one transit. You have to measure during many, many uh, uh, transits uh, as the planet passes in, in, in front. And so, uh, it, it's, it requires a lot, of, a lot of effort. And one thing to remember as well is that you're only measuring the part of the atmosphere that is transparent. And so, for example, when we consider uh, the case of Venus, uh, Venus has a very opaque atmosphere, which has, of course, been a, a large part of the problem of us being able to understand what's going on at the surface. And so, uh, and so, that creates a lot of degeneracy in the models, which I mentioned before is that there's a many models which fit the same data. And so uh, one of the things that we're trying to make sure that we understand is that if we only get access to the very top of the atmosphere, how reliably can we use that to infer the surface conditions? Great, thank you for that answer. So I'd like to encourage everyone to continue to stay on. The sky's finally getting dark here in Fairfax, Virginia. And so we're gonna soon transition to the second portion of our presentation tonight, which will include a live telescope viewing uh, with the George Mason Observatory remotely. Our second question comes from Denise Degas. Uh, apologies if I uh, mistakenly pronounce your name. What will a Venus rover be made of? The moving parts like wheels? How does that work? Yeah, I was, so when I first um, started uh, attending Venus meetings, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, which, which incidentally was, was really me forcing myself on the Venus community. Where essentially what happened was, as I mentioned, I've been studying exoplanets for 25 years. But then uh, in the era of Kepler, I realized that Kepler would start finding these Venus analogs and we didn't know anything about them. So around about 2010, I started inviting myself to these Venus meetings. Uh, and just, it's, it's really, great occasionally to go to these meetings where you know nobody. <laughs> and um, uh, one of the first things I discovered when going to those meetings was the, uh, as I mentioned, the technology has come a long way. And I was very interested in all of these uh, people like uh, Ball, Aerospace, and other groups who were designing uh, these, uh, these new concepts and uh, using new materials that could be used in a Venus environment. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what they're made of, but, but one thing I did learn quite importantly was that the re part of the reason that the Venera landers didn't last very long is because of the electronics in those stages. The very first thing to go was silicon electronics would just <laughs> deteriorate very quickly. Well, that part has certainly come a long way. And the, uh, the electronics and the substrates that are used to design that uh, 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 have much more robust materials now. And so that's, that's really the main part that allows them to uh, continue for much longer on the surface. Fascinating. I, I really just did not think about, you know, how long it's been since we've had something on the surface of Venus. And when was the last orbiter uh, around Venus? It's been a while then too. Yeah, so, so uh, as I mentioned, we, we, there's currently a Japanese orbiter called the Katsuki. Uh, there's kind of been one per decade because uh, the last NASA one was Magellan that was during the 90s 
And then during the 2000s, there was a European one called the Venus Express. Uh, and, uh, and then this, uh, this present decade is dominated by the, by the Japanese uh, space program. But the last NASA one, that was, that was 90s. Wow, we're getting old, Stephen. All right, so our, our next question uh, comes from PCOCIS. Uh, does Venus and Mars provide a geographical boundary for astrobiological studies for a habitable zone? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, um, part of the, you know, well, so as I said, 10 years ago, I started going to these Venus meetings. And one, one thing I very quickly found was that they were a data staff community. They looked with great envy at their Martian colleagues who just seemed to have missions and rovers and things thrown at them all the time. Uh, <laughs> and there's a good reason for that, of course, is because Mars is a, uh, an, a far more accessible place where we can uh, look for look for evidence of recent, relatively recent water flows and life and things like that. Uh, so I, I would say for for Mars, Mars is in, incredibly important as an astrobiology target, uh, but inside of our solar system, outside of our solar system, Mars actually isn't very relevant to to, to the boundaries of the Hubble zone, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that Mars is, the, is half the size of the Earth. The reason that that's a problem is that for one thing, uh, as Peter well, well knows, when we're looking for these uh, planets around other stars, we very quickly run into detection limits around Earth size. Trying to get to Mars size objects uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, and there's anthropic reasons that we're always gonna be interested in Earth size planets anyway. Uh, people are always going to uh, be more interested when you say earth size uh, than Mars size. But if you say earth size, that's equivalent to saying Venus size, which is why Venus is, is very interesting in, in that regard. But the other thing is that uh, Mars, uh, we know that had surface liquid water probably for only the first half a billion years of its history. And so, uh, whereas with Venus, the more recent models predict that it could have had uh, surface liquid water up until recently as only a billion years ago, which is extraordinarily recent. And, um, and in terms of defining the boundaries, what we tend to do with the Hubble zone is we essentially take the Earth. This goes back to the, um, uh, many of the, the models that were developed by Jim Casting at Penn State uh, in the early 90s. He would essentially take the Earth and run a thought experiment of what would happen if I moved the Earth closer to the sun, further away from the sun, uh, and uh, really basing it on Earth models. And that's pretty important because it means that if, if there have been other things other than just the amount of energy that the planet receives that have influenced evolution, uh, certainly with Mar Mars, it was a lot to do with its size. With Venus, there could have been other things. It has a different rotation rate, doesn't have a moon. There's, there's a whole lot of different things about Venus. But, um, but at least Mars, uh, uh, well, so at least Venus tells us uh, about our approximation for an inner boundary uh, where we suspect that that really truly is the case. But we're going to need to measure these atmospheres for exoplanets to know that for sure. At the moment, you can really consider the Hubble zone a hypothesis as our best guess in extremely limited data. Um, one thing I do always say though, is that whenever anybody says, we only have one data point when it comes to Hubble planets. No, we have two because Venus tells is an additional data point and you could consider Mars a potential third data point as well. But the, really the, the, the truth is going to lie in when we look at planets around other stars uh, really defining what the Hubble zone actually means. Thank you for that answer. You know, I'm a big fan of your paper where you did something no other astronomer thought of. Uh, a lot of astronomers in my in our community they focus on measuring this quantity called eta sub Earth, which is a fraction of sun-like stars that have Earth-sized planets at the right uh, distance from their stars. To if they had liquid water in an atmosphere, sorry, if they had water in an atmosphere, that water would be liquid on the surface. And you went and calculated the frequency of Venus-like planets, uh, uh, exoplanets, uh, uh, from the Kepler mission. Our final question uh, is related, and it comes from Brandy. What factors, and you've answered this a little bit already as well, what factors are considered most important 
when modeling the data found out about these exoplanets and what known exoplanets seem most promising? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, in terms of the factors that are most important, it's, um, it, it's one of these areas where we are kind of um, uh, fumbling about in the dark, but in a, in a kind of a guided way. And what I mean by that is that, as I mentioned during my talk, the models that we use to model planetary atmospheres are largely based upon the Earth. And the Earth is an extremely complex system. There are a lot of things which go into it. There's the topography of the Earth and the fraction of continent and oceans and, and obviously the size of the planet, but also the rotation period of the Earth, the obliquity, the tilt of the Earth's axis, uh, and, and the albedo or the fraction of light that is reflected from both the clouds and the surface of the planet. Now, all of those things I just mentioned we currently we can only measure about one or two <laughs> and, and in particular the radius uh i mentioned that when we um uh, find planets using the transit method we we measure the radius a lot of these other things we have to just assume uh and it's a, it's a very um difficult territory because it's going to rely on future direct imaging missions maybe things like the habitable exoplanet images that i mentioned that might be able to potentially measure things like rotation period or, um, or continent uh, uh, surface liquid water fractions, things like that. Uh, but for the moment, it's pretty limited what, we, what information we have. We have the radius. We uh, usually um, have a measurement of the mass. Putting those two together gives us the surface gravity. The surface gravity tells us what we call the scale height of the atmosphere or how, how far the atmosphere will extend into space. So those are some constraints. But the truth is that there are many constraints that we're missing. And when I talk to climate scientists, for example, about this, I've got a few climate scientists collaborators, and I say to them, you know, what would you need to know to interpret this spectrum of an atmosphere? They'll they say to me something like, well, I definitely need to know the rotation rate. And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> and so I, so, but it's, it's a lesson to us because it means that we need to start thinking about how we're going to measure that now uh, in order to unlock that. Hey, we should talk. I have an idea. But uh, we have one more question, but it's, uh, we're already at the first hour. I, again, let's uh, thank Dr. Stephen Kane for a wonderful talk and Q&A session. Um, Thank you all for joining us tonight. Please stay in the second hour. We're going, we're not, hopefully not gonna stay for this whole second hour, but we'll, we'll see how things go. Um, we're going to now transition to the next portion of uh, tonight's uh, even, evening, virtual evening under the stars. Uh, and Stephen, we hope you stick around because we do have another question and I do like to pose it and you can always jump in. I don't think Venus is up right now, unfortunately. It'd be fun to look at Venus after all of that, but we uh, we will look at it again in a future one of these events. Okay, it's so- a, It's a morning star at the moment rather than an evening star. Yeah, that's, that's right. We did look at it in the spring though. All right, so you should all uh, now be seeing my screen, uh, hopefully. Um, and uh, you should see a, a view of the of a sky here. And I'm going to now turn it over to Brandon Toth, who's a, an undergraduate student here at George Mason. He's going to tell you a little bit about the observatory and uh, what we're looking at. Oh, hi. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Um, so I'm Brandon Toth. Um, so basically, I just wanted to go over a quick uh, fun facts about the observatory. Um, so this is technically uh, the third observatory that GMU has had. Um, I mean, the first two weren't, uh, which you I guess you would say actual observatories like the one we have now. Um, I think the first one it said was this pig shed back in 1975 and another one was, um, uh, I think the same pig shed, but moved somewhere else in the 80s. Uh, and then we also, the current observatory though was uh, built in, was opened in 2007. Um, so roughly a little bit over a decade that it's been here. Um, we have a 32, I think it's right here I have, it's a 32 inch uh, uh, Richie, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna very well mispronounce this, Richie. Richie Cretion. Yeah. Richie Cretion, Capsicronian uh, telescope. Um, 
And I always thought this was interesting. The cost was three hundred thousand dollars. I think that that's a that gives you an example of uh, how precious some of this equipment can be. Um, so tonight, I think we're so we're looking at the moon, and uh, I believe it was a a galaxy that we were going to be looking at. We're yeah, that's right. Uh, could you uh, start by uh, sharing with everyone kind of the view that we're looking at here on their screen? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, so in the upper left-hand corner is our telescope. That's the 32-inch telescope that I was just telling you about. Um, in the uh, lower left-hand corner is uh, the observatory dome and the observatory itself that houses the telescope. Um, and we'll be opening that up some point tonight. Um, it takes a little bit, but it's uh, very interesting to see it work. Um, and then in the upper right-hand corner is the control room, I believe. Um, yeah, correct. Currently, yeah. currently unoccupied. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and there, there is some uh, um, insulation there that they we're hoping to install in the dome, if you're wondering what that big giant tube is. Uh, yeah, so why don't we go ahead and uh, um, go ahead and open the dome and uh, the weather looks good and uh, let people see the dome open. Okay. And then while the dome's opening, you're, you'll be able to see it on the screen. If, if you can't see the screen, let me know in the chat. Hopefully I've shared things well enough. Uh, while the dome opens, it's a fairly slow process. Oh, it's actually not opening yet. So let me, do we actually start it opening? Go ahead, Justin or uh, Brandon. All right, I'll uh, go ahead and start opening the dome. We just have to click on, there we go, one second. Let me take control of the mouse for a second. I'll go ahead and... Uh, I'll go ahead and open the dome here. There we go. Our observatory is completely remote control, uh, which has come in very handy during the pandemic. So while the dome is opening, we're going to uh, go ahead and take uh, our last question from Denise Deggs. And Stephen, hopefully feel free to jump in and answer it. Do you have any thoughts on the legal aspects of private enterprise in space? For example, luckily Elon is my homie. But I keep telling them you can't just establish Muscatan as its capital. And thanks for the presentation. It was fabulous. <laughs> uh, I know that there are a lot of people who, who make a full-time career out of thinking about space policy and how that should be implemented. Um, and and uh, they raise various uh, ethical views with that. Also, just simply monopolization, like having having a capital city on Mars called uh, Muscatan uh, probably falls into the purview of that. <laughs> but um, uh, there, there's certainly a lot of people who think about the ethical issues of if there's any possibility of life on Mars and insofar as we would contaminate that, then should we be uh, doing any kind of exploration there? Uh, people have thought a lot about that, but that's why we spend so much time making sure that we properly uh, decontaminate any of the uh, spacecraft that we sent there. What are your thoughts, Peter? Oh, uh, yeah, we're still um, living in space by 1950s space policy and space ethics. And uh, I'm looking forward to some new discussions about that. Uh, yeah, I know astronomers are pretty torn about SpaceX uh, with Everything was going great. We were very happy for SpaceX until they started launching the Starlink satellites, which will uh, could potentially pollute our night sky quite a bit. Uh, pretty soon, we're going to start seeing the lower shutter of the dome uh, opening up. And uh, we're, the views are seen, just so everyone knows, these are infrared cameras. So it looks like the it's very bright out. And we are seeing the heat uh, from the end of the day in the sky. There goes the lower shutter. Uh, uh, opening right now. Uh, so it's, it's not nearly as uh, bright as it looks on the cameras. And then I'll, I'll take control of the desktop for a second. And Justin, why don't you, um, well, Brandon, uh, can you, well, let me actually keep it in the view for now. 
Uh, Brandon, if you could uh, describe a little bit about what we're going to see over here on the left. What, it, what are we looking at in this uh, left window here? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, so you just want me to go over uh, the uh, program that we're using or? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Um, so this right here, let me, um, is uh, the Skydex uh, Professional Edition. It's basically, uh, from my knowledge, because um, I am relatively new, um, is what we use to uh, position the telescope. Um, it's kind of like a guide, I guess you could say, um, to put it simply. And uh, we just uh, use it to find what we're looking for. So for instance, the last thing we were looking for was the cat's eye nebula. nebula. And um, we just <clears throat> type that in and then uh, the telescope will automatically turn to whatever uh, we put in there. Excellent, thanks, Brandon. Uh, one of the things I wanna point out in the lower right, we can actually now see the telescope through the opening in the dome. Uh, and that nicely, sh there's a door beneath that. And that's a normal sized uh, human door. Uh, and, uh, you know, as opposed to some other kind of uh, species door. And uh, uh, so that gives you a sense of scale uh, for the size of, size of our observatory. It's located on the roof of Research Hall on the Fairfax campus. And we do use it every clear night for, for research. Okay, so um, at this point in time, we're going to go ahead and spin the dome and sync it to where the telescope's looking. Uh, at the same time, we're going to go ahead and point at the moon and take our first images so people can see the moon uh, uh, with our live feed uh, nicely uh, viewed through our telescope. So go ahead and do that, Justin. The floor is yours. And Stephen, have you seen our observatory before? No, this is my first time seeing it. Cool. Yeah, you know a little bit about George Mason. I do, yes. It's always fun when you're inside the dome of a telescope and the dome's spinning, because if you're not careful, you'll think that you're the one that's spinning and not the dome. Uh, it's a definite frame of reference uh, mind trick. Okay, so we're now turning the dome to uh, face where the telescope's located. Justin, go ahead and slew the telescope to the moon. And uh, feel free to continue to ask questions about the observatory or the presentation in the chat. Uh, someone did ask privately about uh, uh, whether we said a uh, fish shed or pig shed. I, I did say, um, uh, Brandon did say uh, pig shed. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, back when the uh, Mason, George Mason was founded, it was a fairly um, uh, rural farm area at the time. Um, oh, you know what, but we forgot what we forgot to do. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to turn the telescope. We're, we're close to the right position anyway. Before we look at the moon, we're actually going to turn the telescope closer to the horizon. So Justin, go ahead and after that slew is complete, go ahead and point it right at the camera. And um, uh, you'll have to zoom in on the, the Sky X there to do that. Uh, and we'll, we'll give you a view of the primary mirror. Uh, look down the barrel of the telescope. Yeah, Justin, we'll have to violate the rules on the horizon limits in order to get a good view. Uh, what you're seeing right now is that we're starting to look inside the tube of the telescope and we see a structure there in the middle. Um, yeah, you'll just have to wait, but zoom in on the on the sky X so you can get it even closer to the horizon. Uh, well, you pretty much do have to get it all the way down to like two to three degrees above the horizon. Uh, but that structure we're seeing there is the back of the primary mirror Oh, sorry, the back of the secondary mirror. The light goes through the tube. Most of it misses that structure. It reflects off the mirror that we'll see pretty soon and then bounces off a little mirror at the top of the telescope tube and sends the light down through a hole in the center of the telescope uh, where um, the camera that we're going to be using tonight to, to view the, the night sky views is located. And we'll show you what that looks like a little bit later. Justin, I'll go ahead and take over for a second. Uh, just so we can get there a little bit uh, 
uh, more readily. Let's see. Let's go here. It's going to give us the horizon warning, and that's okay. We'll just go ahead and violate that. So how, here now we're getting uh, nicely in the view, and then I got to move it. I always guess this wrong. I'm going to guess the direction I need to go here. Oh, wait for it to finish. There we go. Did I guess right? Yes. Okay. And then we'll bring the telescope even closer. Horizon. Now we see the mirror uh, down at the bottom of the telescope tube, and I can tip it down a little bit more for you uh, once it's finished moving. Uh, let's go a little bit further. Go into the mountains, as it were. I'm going a little bit too fast for the for, for the telescope to keep up. There we go. And now we can actually see the hole um, in the middle of the telescope there. So the light comes in, bounces off that mirror, and we can actually see the reflection of that tube there uh, on top of the hole. Uh, and that's uh, how we go. Uh, and that's how the light gets uh, to the other side of the telescope where our camera is located. So now we're going to go back to the moon and we'll switch over to our camera view um, uh, that's sitting on the other side of that hole. And we'll show you what that looks like later. All right, so Justin, I'll give you back control and um, go ahead and start uh, operating the camera with the H alpha filter. And Brandon, do you have any facts you'd like to share with us uh, about the moon? Uh, sure, I actually uh, am pretty excited to share this one. So uh, personally, um, I come from an astronomy family and one of my great, great, great uncles was John Alfred Bashir of Pittsburgh. Um, he was an astronomer and the uh, little bit of time director of the Allegheny Observatory. Uh, the far side of the moon, which we wouldn't ever be able to see with the telescope is actually an impact crater named after him. So um, I've always been really interested with the moon and astronomy. Uh, I know recently we actually uh, ended up finding uh, deposits of uh, possible deposits of water, so that leaves an interesting uh, um, idea of what it would be like if we ever do end up having a moon base, uh, what that could possibly lead to. Um, so I think that's just uh, some interesting future ideas as well, some implications of it. Okay, we've got our first image from the, the camera and it doesn't look like much and it may be very well that we have uh, uh, the tertiary mirror pointed in the right direction. So we'll get that, uh, we'll take a quick look at that. So go ahead and Justin and uh, um, take a look at the, yeah, the, uh, it looks like a scenario spot. Okay, uh, you're just saturated. So let's just take another exposure with the uh, shorter exposure time. There we go. So digital cameras are, are not as great as our eyes, but they do have some big benefits over our, our eyes. So this is a, a 16 megapixel camera. There we go. That's a beautiful view of the moon. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and take control for a second, Justin, and I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in on it and pan around uh, so people can see. Uh, it looks like uh, the focus is okay. This is a raw image. Um, taken with a, a 16 megapixel camera. It's black and white. I'll zoom out a little bit. That's a little uh, too close. And we can see we're actually at a full moon right now. So um, this, we're basically seeing the fully near full moon. We're seeing the near fully lit portion uh, of the moon tonight. That's why we also can't really go after uh, some really bright uh, targets. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for answering the question. Why is there a horizon warning? Thank you for uh, jumping in on that. Uh, I think that's Tycho Crater just off the bottom of our camera. Um, and we could see uh, some of these dark regions and bright regions. Uh, and those are the, the lunar mare, and I can't actually name them all. Uh, but, uh, but there you go. There's the moon. Are there any other questions or any questions people might have about this view of the moon? Uh, feel free to type those questions in the chat. One of those things I will say is that we're looking at the, the moon here in a very narrow band filter of red light. 
um, basically because our telescope is pretty large and the moon is very bright. Uh, and so uh, we're actually using a very short exposure of you know, under a tenth of a second, even with just this tiny color of red uh, led into our digital camera. Uh, and, uh, and we're still, uh, the moon is still kind of uh, saturating parts of our, parts of our image. Uh, we do encourage you to come back to a future session when the moon quite isn't uh, in a, um, a full moon phase and we can get a bit more detail. I can zoom a little bit further in here. Now let's take a look at some more of the surface structure. Looks like we might be a little bit out of focus at the moment and we'll, we'll touch that up uh, when we go to our next target. Uh, yeah, we're just a little bit out of focus, but we'll touch that up later. Well, let's try and mess with it. Why not? That actually looks a little better. Yeah, great. Let's go in and take another close look at the moon. We see some craters there. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful close in view. Okay, so. Uh, uh, okay, there is a question. Yeah, there's, uh, there's uh, from Kathy writes. Uh, there's a penumbral eclipse soon, right? How much will we see in Virginia? I'll be honest with you. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, maybe um, Patrick or um, uh, uh, one of our other uh, students on the call can uh, take a look. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, Justin, I'm going to turn the control over back to you. Uh, go ahead and take us to M82. And uh, while we're doing that, before you get do that, I'm going to after you hit SLU, uh, bring up this telescope view so we can uh, watch the, the telescope move. All right, Justin, go ahead.
Oh, I've been muted the whole time. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, thank you for calling me out on that. Uh, I've been talking this whole time. Oh, no. All right. Uh, I'll start over again. Justin, go ahead and, uh, uh, well, hold on. Let me explain a little bit. So, uh, I'm sorry I muted myself. Did you hear me talking about the black octagon at all? Oh boy. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so the black octagon is uh, basically just an aluminum. It, it's metal that uh, holds a primary mirror in place because it's, it's quite heavy. And you can see the, the round primary mirror kind of in between the black struts. Uh, and then the light comes, as we said, the light comes through a hole in the telescope uh, primary mirror in the in the middle and on the other side of that hole, we actually have a third mirror that's round and it rotates um, the light uh, to different ports um, uh, attached to the telescope hanging beneath. And on these ports, we have an eyepiece, which unfortunately we can't look through right now, but we do have this digital camera for which we saw the view from the moon. You might see this U-shaped cord here uh, and that's a uh, connection between the digital camera uh, and the filter wheel that uh, allows us to change the color of light that we're looking at. And then on the left here, you might see these two little handles. That's a spectrograph uh, that we have currently attached to the telescope. And in the future, we hope to add some additional instruments uh, that uh, we'll be able to use. So Justin, go ahead and now let's take an exposure of uh, about uh, 30 seconds or so, and hopefully in the R band, so make sure you change it to the R band. and. Hopefully we'll be able to get a good look, although the sky's a little bright with the moon up, we'll hopefully be able to see the light of 100 billion suns. So you can see some information on the screen here. We have the, the temperature of the camera sensor. One of the key differences between the cameras and your cell phones and the camera we're using here tonight is that we chill it down to a temperature of about minus 22 degrees. Oh yeah, this is M80, this is M82, right, this is M82, not M81, uh, but M81 is nearby. Uh, let me go ahead and change. The sky is still pretty bright tonight, unfortunately, but we can change the the, the mapping here, and maybe I should explain what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, we cool this digital camera down because we're trying to see really faint things. And as it turns out, the pixels in our digital camera are really, uh, they're noisy. And they're noisy in your cell phone too, but you're looking at really bright things when you take pictures in the day. All right, so this is a, a galaxy that looks like we have some um, out of focus uh, water droplets on here, but the focus is actually pretty good. So this is raw data. It's not processed uh, by, the, by the camera that you normally would. And what we're looking at right now is the core of the M82 galaxy. And that's the light of about 100 billion stars that have traveled millions of light years uh, to get to us. And thank goodness our telescope I uh, was open to catch these photons as it as it as they came by after their millions of light year journey. If uh, if you weren't here with us tonight, they would just hit the outside of the dome, and no one would have been here to see them. Uh, so well, we're glad to show you that view. Uh, it's not the best view tonight, unfortunately, because uh, of the bright moon being up. But what I can do here is I can change how the light that's recorded on the camera is displayed and. Um, when a photon of light hits a digital camera, it releases an electron. And what we're really doing is counting photons with a digital camera. And so what I'm doing by dragging these little green and uh, red bars at the bottom is changing um, how those numbers of photons that we recorded are displayed in a grayscale intensity on our screen. So now I can kind of zoom in on the core of that galaxy in a little bit more detail. Uh, next, Justin, I'd like you to do a slew to M81, uh, which is the Cigar Galaxy, uh, which is, is a little bit more exciting view. And we'll try to do a 60 second exposure on that. 
Uh, and uh, then we got some more exciting things to share with you before we wrap things up. Uh, and M82, Justin, um, Messier 82. Uh, so are there any questions we have? All right, Stephen, thanks for joining us tonight. We're uh, glad to have you. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us from California. One of the great things about these evenings under the stars now that they are virtual for the time being uh, is that we can have uh, some uh, fabulous um, professional astronomers from around the world uh, join us. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick move uh, to another nearby galaxy. It's actually part of a, a galaxy group. Um, and hang on for this view. Uh, Justin, do you need a hand with this? Here, I'll, I'll go ahead and grab it. There we go. And go ahead and go over back to the CCD. It's a pretty quick slew and the telescope didn't move very much at all. Uh, but let's go ahead and take another exposure. This time, I think we'll do a bit of a longer exposure, exposure and it'll be worth the wait. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to ask any questions you might have uh, in the chat. While we're waiting, uh, one of the things I'll share about this view of the um, M82 galaxy uh, is that you see a whole bunch of uh, bright objects here next to um, our galaxy. The focus actually is not that bad uh, tonight. Um, these are just stars in our own galaxy, um, kind of uh, blocking our view of things outside of our galaxy. There's a nice double star in the field of view, and I can kind of stretch that a little bit and give you a view. The focus is okay. I might want to touch that up a little bit more. But this is a nice uh, binary star. And here comes the next exposure. One of the things that happens at the beginning of the night is that the temperature is rapidly changing after sunset. And that can um, affect our, our um, ability to focus the starlight on the digital camera. Here we are at uh, M81. It uh, looks exactly the same. So I must, have, I must have gone to the wrong galaxy. Uh, sorry, I meant to go to M82. Well, that's a better view of the thing we were just looking at it. We'll come back to that, my apologies. And yeah, let's go ahead and go to M82, the Cigar Galaxy, right next door. So we'll be there real quick. Now these galaxies are definitely uh, part of a, a group of galaxies uh, relatively close together on the sky. Well, let's kick off one more exposure. Now that we've the sky is maybe darkened a little bit more and we've gotten um, a slightly uh, longer, double the exposure time. We might have a little bit more detail on the galaxy that we took originally. And I'll go ahead and we'll just take a look at that. Uh, the sky actually did get a little bit brighter. Yeah, there we go. So that's the core. And you can see that the light from this galaxy is dominated by um, the, the core of that galaxy, downtown uh, Messier 81. Okay, great. Another 15 seconds, we'll have the next. Uh, oh, Brandy asked a question. Well, what's the actual distance between those two stars? Well, on the sky, uh, the angular distance between them is about, uh, by my experience on working with this uh, telescope, maybe about five to 10 arc seconds, um, probably more like 10 arc seconds apart. Um, and an arc second for those that don't know is, um, let's get the view back up here. Uh, one degree, if you divide a degree into 60 pieces, um, there we go, that's the view I was looking for. This is the cigar galaxy. So I'm gonna uh, adjust the display here 
but this is a beautiful view. I didn't finish um, the, what I was talking about earlier, but long story short, um, let me hit reset here. I'll come back to the angular distance question. Here we go. All right, that's a little bit too stretched. All right, so this is the uh, what's known as the starburst galaxy. I'll zoom out a little bit. Um, this is a just an amazing uh, uh, galaxy to behold. It, it's it's called the starburst galaxy. Um, it's an, it is a spiral galaxy that we are looking at from the side. But what's unusual about it is that it's got a huge amount of star formation uh, taking place at the moment. And um, that's due to, uh, actually, um, what was thought to, do, to be due to collisions uh, with maybe a satellite galaxy or something that took place in, in the recent past of the history of this galaxy. And so you can actually see these kind of dark bands of dust um, small solid particles uh, in the cigar galaxy. Uh, and we see these kind of bright blobs of bursts of star formation. So this is indicating that this galaxy has a lot more activity uh, going on um, than our own Milky Way does. We'll zoom in on that one more time. Okay, great. Uh, so um, that concludes the main portion of tonight's uh, show. Uh, we do hope that you join us uh, for a future event. Uh, we do have more, so if you'd like to stay around, you're welcome to stay. I mean, I, um, we are actually going to start observing for the NASA test mission uh, right now, uh, and I'm going to pass the baton over to some students that will be doing that tonight, uh, and we'll keep this Zoom call going uh, for a little bit, and I'll explain what they're doing. But just uh, briefly, for those of you that are going to drop off soon, uh, we do have an event with the Smithsonian Associates program on July 14th uh, uh, on life in the universe with uh, the great Dr. Michael Summers of George Mason University. Uh, he's also published some books about exoplanets that you're welcome to read. And um, we'll also have some Northern Virginia Astronomy Club meetings. Uh, and um, uh, we will uh, also have a future virtual evening under the stars with a, a, a speaker to be announced. And uh, that will, next one will be on July 30th. And then we'll continue that in August, one more event in August. And then we will have uh, events starting every other week um, in the um, fall semester as the semester uh, gets underway at George Mason University. Whether it's online or in person, we don't know yet, but um, Certainly this, these events will be online. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, Michael, uh, go ahead and take control. You asked about whether or not to take darks and flats. Uh, go ahead and do that at the end, if you don't mind. Um, um, we can always do that uh, uh, at another time. So what's gonna happen right now is uh, um, Michael's gonna go ahead and take care, take control of the computer. There is a, a candidate planet that's been uh, identified by the NASA test mission. And uh, thank you for everyone joining. You're welcome to stay on. Um, and but your um, the official part of this program is now over. Uh, so what we're doing tonight is there's a candidate, and we it's a an inflate a suspected inflated hot Jupiter. Uh, I forget its uh, TOI number, test object of interest number, uh, and. Uh, it happens to be passing in front of its star in just under, um, I believe, uh, two hours from now. And uh, we need to collect data on the star to uh, monitor the brightness of the star before the planet starts passing in front of the star. And then we're going to go ahead and um, monitor it while it's passing in front of the star and after as well. And so Michael's actually going to be starting a program here that we've been working on here at George Mason University that actually replaces the human with a, with a, a program that's actually gonna go ahead and execute uh, the observations. And he's actually looking up the number right now. Uh, so it's 1800 something. Uh, and it happens to be a possible hot Jupiter. That means it's a planet the size of Jupiter that goes around its star um, every few days. And uh, 1829, there we go, there's the name of it. 
Uh, and uh, those are really fascinating. We have nothing like that in our solar system at all, right? The closest planet to our sun is Mercury with an orbital period of 90 days. And so this is the, the program, the configuration for the program that you're seeing on the screen right now. And I'll just narrate what Michael's doing. This is fun. Uh, and there we have the coordinates, so the right ascension and declination of the, of the star and its planet. Um, they're very similar to latitude and longitude. Those are actually the lines you see drawn on the sky in the virtual view of the night sky that we've been looking at tonight. Uh, and so we've specified the, the data that we're gonna collect here uh, for the telescope. And once he does start that program, we'll go ahead and watch the telescope move to the target on its own. Uh, and hopefully get some data. We'd really like to confirm this um, hot Jupiter. We know of actually a few hundred hot Jupiters already uh, in our universe. They were actually among the first discovered exoplanets because they're the easiest to find. They block the most amount of light from the star and they are the easiest to detect the gravitational influence of the planet on the star called the wobble, wobble method. So the very first planet around a main sequence star like our sun, 51 Peg B, uh, is an example of a hot Jupiter. The very first planet that was discovered that passes in front of its star with respect to our line of sight, HD2, uh, yeah, HD 209458b, uh, which was discovered in 1998, um, also is a hot Jupiter. Uh, and this one in particular is pretty big for its size. Um, uh, most hot Jupiters are about the same radius of Jupiter, maybe up to about 40% as large. And this one's particularly puffy. And so we'd like to help confirm uh, whether or not it's actually a real exoplanet. And so one of the ways to do that, well, why do, we, why do we do this if the test mission already spotted it? The test mission monitors a huge portion of the sky at the same time, and it made some sacrifices in order to do that. One of the sacrifices that it made, uh, even though it's in space and gets exquisite precision in measuring the brightnesses of stars, uh, uh, why is the end time before the start time? That's a good question, uh, Peter. I didn't quite see that. Uh, oh yeah, you forgot to update that. Thanks, you found a mistake. Well done. <laughs> um, good, good catch. Um, yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, glad somebody's <laughs> paying attention. This is good. I'm glad we had you on the line tonight to help us out. Um, I forgot where I was with that. Uh, I don't know if we've, slew, oh, we've parked the telescope. All right, he's getting ready to run the script. It's a Python program and you can see that he's uh, getting ready, Michael's getting ready to run the program. Uh, whatever you'd like to do, Michael, um, if you'd like to close it and reopen it, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever is easier for you. And they get to watch the dome close. That's always fun. So we'll go ahead and uh, keep that little view in the lower right. You can see the dome closing. Uh, we still have uh, 26 people online. That's fantastic. Um, okay. Uh, now I totally forgot, lost my train of thought. Um, oh yeah, we still have that spelling error in the username too. Oh well. We'll have to fix that someday. Uh, yeah, I forget what I was talking about. Probably about the test mission. Oh yeah, so the test mission had to sacrifice um, pixel size. So in order to cover a huge part of the sky, the NASA test mission has pixels that are 22 arc seconds on the side. I never defined what an arc second was earlier. Let me go ahead and do that. If you take 360 degrees in a circle, and if you take one of those degrees and divide them into 60 pieces, we call that one arc minute. Uh, if you then take that one arc minute and divide it into 60 pieces, we call that an arc second. For comparison, the width of a full moon, like we were looking at earlier, is around 30 arc minutes. Uh, so that's actually seems uh, pretty big. The test pixels, I said, were 22 arc seconds, a little uh, under a half of an arc minute. So you'd think those are plenty small, but they're actually not. They're quite large in astronomical parlance. The images we were just looking at of the moon and the cigar galaxy, each one of those pixels 
uh, covers 0 0.3 arc seconds. And so our telescope can actually do a better job of seeing spatial information uh, than the test mission. The test views of the night sky, even though it's in space and does really well, uh, are much blurrier. Um, and let me just type quickly to uh, the students uh, in our side chat here. Uh, and so we follow up candidates with the NASA test mission. We've done, I think, close to 100 um, of these observations now over the past couple of years uh, because there are other stars in the sky between, besides the stars for which we are, have been looking at and may think have a candidate exoplanet. And what we're looking for is when the star passes in front, the brightness of the star dips and then it recovers. But if we happen to have a star doing nothing, even though we think it has a planet, and then there's two other faint stars nearby and they're passing in front of each other, they produce very big dips in brightness, but TESS sees a combined light from all three stars. And so it looks like a planet passing in front of the star when it's actually a star doing nothing and two stars passing in front of each other. So we call that a false positive. Um, or we call it sometimes a background eclipsing binary or a blended eclipsing binary, and those aren't exoplanets. And so we have to rule out those scenarios, and that's one of the key steps uh, in support of the NASA test mission in confirming these candidates. There are several, there are many steps, and, and we've been contributing to this uh, particular step. Okay, so um, Michael is about ready to run his script. He's kind of disconnected the software, and now we're going to watch the software. Uh, as soon as he hits enter here, eventually, it's going to go ahead and start running. It's going to reopen the dome um, and uh, then uh, start um, uh, talking to all the pieces of the telescope. Oh, no, it looks like we're having problems with the robofocus there. Michael, let me know if that's uh, an issue. Um, but otherwise, uh, feel free to keep going. And uh, then it should soon start reopening the telescope and, and moving to the target. Uh, did we have to start it over again, Michael? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, go ahead. This code is new and we're still testing it. And this is one of our nights where we're trying to see how it's working. Uh, so uh, you're seeing uh, uh, real astronomy research happening in real time. Sorry about that, Michael. Here we go, there goes the telescope moving to the target. If you could bring that view into uh, front and center, Michael, for a little bit, we'd appreciate that. You'd also see the dome opening again. I think what we'll do is we'll probably end this Zoom session um, after we get our first images. Um, of this target and I'll explain a little bit about what's going on. Uh, but basically we're going to just stay on this target for the rest of the night uh, because the transit lasts a couple hours and so we want a couple of hours of data before the event happens and a couple of day, uh, events after so this really ends all night. Uh, and the good news is that this program will monitor the weather um, although we're still testing it make sure it's working properly so that it will stop and close it up if we have any issues. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. This has been a, a real fun to share this with you. Notice in the live view now that the sky looks a lot darker uh, as the, the heat of the, of the night has kind of um, dissipated.
I'd like to thank Brandon uh, for uh, hosting today. Uh, and I'd like to thank Justin Wittrock uh, for hosting today as well. I'd like to thank some of our other students that were on the call tonight, including Patrick Newman and William Matsko. And we look forward to um, all of you coming back and joining us again uh, in four weeks or in eight weeks or in 10, 12, 14, 16 weeks. We'll keep this going uh, for the for a long time, as long as we can until we are back in person uh, with large events on campus. You can see the lower shutter opening again. Good news, we should get a nice view of the, oh, maybe the dome hasn't slewed yet. That's probably right. So the dome's gonna turn after it finishes opening. You can see some status messages from the program uh, that Michael has uh, been writing. Um, while it continues to work. Thanks, Kathy, for joining. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's session, please tell your friends and family to uh, go ahead and join these sessions in the future. It's relatively easy for us to have large group sizes in these meetings and uh, we encourage all of you to come back for future nights. Uh, we'll have different views, different targets to look at every time uh, because as we go over the course of the year, the night sky changes and we're looking at different constellations and different uh, pieces of the night sky. There goes the dome on its way to matching up with the telescope. I guess oh, actually it's homing first, okay. Really cool how this program works. I, Michael, you've done an amazing job with it. I'm gonna do a quick weather check while we're at it too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're fine. Beautiful night tonight. First clear night we've had in a long time, a few weeks uh, with um, everything looks good tonight. Uh, one of the reasons that we've uh, written this code to operate the campus telescope is it's uh, it's fairly difficult to stay up all night when you've got a homework set due the next day. Oh, we got a telescope slew error, so we may have to restart again. Okay, no problem. Yeah, it says it's tracking on the target, Michael, but we'll see um, We'll see what it does. If you need to rerun it, then you need to rerun it and that's okay. There we go. Right now, the, the, the code is waiting for the camera to cool down. What's the set point you use, Michael? Uh, oh, it's not going to get there. Oh, we have to wait for it to realize it can't get there. And then it'll adjust the set point temperature. So that might take a little while. Right. Thank you for uh, commenting on that. What's the, what's the number of minutes it waits and decides it can't reach the set point? Is it five minutes? Currently eight minutes, okay. I don't know how long it's been running um, at the cooling point, but maybe it's been that long or soon. Yeah, it's really hot out right now and um, we have, um, uh, we run a, a electro, um, thermoelectrical cooler 
on this digital camera. The colder we make it, the more sensitive our camera is. And right now it's too hot for it to reach um, the best temperature we can do. And uh, in the future, um, we, we're gonna install a liquid cooling closed cycle system that will, will help us get to these cooler temperatures. And you might have to adjust the code if we need to. It looks like you have to restart it anyway, Michael. So go ahead and give it a reboot and maybe um, adjust the set point for tonight for now. Sweet. So is it gonna close and open again or is it just gonna stay open? Yeah, we'll see, right? Oh, yeah. So the camera, we basically adjusted the temperature we're telling the camera to cool to. Uh, and after a little while, it'll realize that it's at the proper temperature and the code that should move on. It's starting to collect data and we're waiting for that. Thank you for everyone still staying on to watch this. Glad you're here. Cooler has settled, there you go. All right. Michael is an undergraduate in the physics and astronomy program at George Mason University. He's been working in my research group for somewhere around a year now. Okay, so at the moment we're, as Michael said on the, the, the chat, it's now taking a test image to uh, automatically attempt to focus the telescope and that might take a while, but we'll see, see how it does. So we want to concentrate the light from individual stars in as, in as few, as pix few pixels as possible uh, to um, get the sharpest image we can, because we're really interested in seeing if there are any nearby faint stars that could be mimicking the effect of, a, of an exoplanet that the test mission could be confused by. So far for the test mission for the past two years, it's been fairly reliable. I'd say maybe 30% um, maybe of the candidates have turned out to be false positives. A decent fraction of them are still um, can't, good candidates. Uh, we've got Owen Alfaro on the line. Michael and Owen, if you want to move some of the um, uh, chat over to the virtual observatory control room, feel free to feel free to do so. Um, but uh, just remember that we have uh, a number of guests on the line with us tonight. Uh, so this is actually the first image of our target field of view. I think uh, they're they're double checking that right now. Um, we see a, a large field of stars in the field of view. I don't actually know uh, which one is our target and uh, somewhat immaterial for, for the audience tonight. 
But one of these stars is the target that we're interested in. We're looking at a field of view about the size of the full moon, for those of you that have been with us uh, since the beginning tonight, when we saw the moon earlier. And we're going to use all the data on all these stars because the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way and it messes things up. And uh, um, you know, the flicker of starlight that you see when you look at the night sky, the twinkle, astronomers hate that. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it basically limits our ability to measure the brightnesses and positions of stars accurately. Uh, and we're always trying to come up with ways to get around that. Uh, one way to get around that sure, surely is to go to space, uh, but that's expensive. Uh, looks like we got to restart. Oh, bummer. Okay, so we're testing the focus mechanism for the first time, and it might not be, uh, it, it, well, it might be struggling a little bit. So we're going to get a look at the source code tonight. Michael's going to go in and make a real-time change with an audience. That is very brave of you, Michael. So here you can see an example of the Python code. Um, that is uh, locating stars, it looks like, and uh, uh, working on the focusing. We might just need to skip over the focusing tonight. Oh, we don't have to. We, you can do whatever you want, Michael. All right, so we saw the field of view. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and continue with the observations. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end uh, the Zoom call. And uh, we welcome you back. Um, have a good July 4th holiday weekend. Thank you, Dorothy, for the reminder. I kind of forgot it's July already. And uh, we'll see everyone in the future. And thanks for joining us. And please subscribe to our newsletter uh, so you can get our monthly updates of events and uh, highlights of research and student work. And um, we'll see you all again. Until then, take care.